All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayyid from drmubeen.com. Welcome to one more show. This is a third discussion today. Thank you for <laughs> hanging out with me. So, uh, Dee Diaz, you are first today. Algebra Bean, how are you doing from Chicago? Ruby Zared, how are you? I actually saw Siddhartha today as well after a long number of days. Carolyn, how are you? Doug, how are you? Denise, yo, yo, back to you. Sunshine Bean, hello. Texas, not first. Yeah, that is for sure. <laughs> Hello, uh, Christy. Hello, Lizzie. Hola. Uh, Algebra Bean says, I read that study, Dr. Bean. You clarified my questions. Thank you. Very good. So, Algebra Bean, you are quite thorough with the with these uh, uh, studies. Michelle says, I love Dr. Bean's joy, his laughter. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Some people are very annoyed by my laughter. There are actually comments on Twitter and on YouTube to say, stop giggling. And I think we should tell each other to laugh more and to be happy more instead of saying to be less happy. Um, Didi is saying, how is Shahida doing? Um, let me ask her. I haven't seen her for some days. This is correct. But <clears throat> um, I think... Uh, what was her name? Let me see. Samina. So Shahida, I think, had passed away. So uh, Samina, I'm just going to leave a message to Samina as I, <clears throat> Dr. Samina. So Dr. Shahida, I think, has passed away because of her liver cancer. So Texas says, Dr. Bean Medical, let him at <laughs> let me at him. Your giggle is the best. Thank you very much. My giggles are so spontaneous that I sometimes don't want to. That is correct, but that's how I am. Carlos, Carlos Ortiz says, Hi, Dr. Bean. Fluvoxamine with or without food. This one I do not know. I don't think it uh, there is any bioavailability issue with it or lipid-related uh, absorption. So, Carlos, I do not know this, but can you please tweet that at me uh, at uh, Dr. Bean underscore medical, and I would look it up and respond. Hey, Siddhartha is here. Hey, Siddhartha, how are you? Saw, saw you after a long number of days. Hopefully, you're doing good. <laughs> Trilli uh, Trillium. Lane says, yes, laugh much. It is actually difficult to be more happy than being more sad. So Mary Lou says, Dr. Means and like, thank you very much. Jenna says, laughing is a good medicine. Absolutely. I actually, I think everybody has stresses and happiness. And um, I feel that this is a good uh, way to be. <clears throat> so a cook says, so if someone gets the virus and recovers, there is no need to get the vaccine. Does natural immunity protect against new strains of the virus and for how long? It's a very good question. And um, let me draw a little bit to respond to this one. I have responded before as well, but I'm just going to give some more. <laughs> did, did you like this little cartoon I made of the binding antibody saying, man, I am just so sad. So, so a cook to your question. Look, if somebody became infected and was able to take care of that infection in a healthy way, didn't develop a cytokine storm, didn't become long haulers, did not end up in a problem, then their immune system, regardless of what the researchers say, antibodies are less, and monoclonal, uh, sorry, the neutralizing or more or, or the binding or less or whatever, regardless of all of that, we know that the body took care of it. That means for this person's immune system, this coronavirus was not a problem. And that means if it happens again in the future, our body would take care of it as well. So that is a general common sense from immune point of view. The problem is, let's say from this point A, where the infection occurred to this point B. For example, let's say there is a year spent between them. 
And during this time, the virus changed a lot. So virus looked like this here, and now virus looks like this. Virus changed a lot. Or the person's immune system changed a lot. Then this virus is going to become a new virus for them. And now they, they may consider taking another vaccine. In practice, if you see uh, in Israel, they said, take vaccine after 90 days of the uh, infection. In uh, other countries, including US, doctors continue to say, take vaccines. I have seen some long haulers. Uh, Dr. Yo put a number on it saying about 20%. He said, uh, and I observed as well, is that long some long haulers, if they have long hauling and they take vaccine, it helps them. So to answer your question uh, for this, ideally, if it is a variant by definition, variant means that not so much of a change that it's a new strain, a new whole new thing. As long as it is a variant, it is in the same ballpark of the original virus. For example, all the variants that we are seeing today are lesser than 0.001% change. Um, think about it, 30, 29,000 amino acid bases. And the changes that we are seeing are 13, 17. So take the percentage of 17 over 29,000, and that is the percentage change. That's a very small change. We can still, as you saw in the previous study, we can still back boost or we can still cross react to the human coronaviruses from SARS-CoV-2, and these viruses are more than 86% different, or sorry, more than 14% different. So why would this 0 0.00 some percent change be too much of a change? So in theory, as long as we have variants, we would continue to protect against them. If, so um, <laughs> there is a joke I used to tell my friends that there was a person who asked another person that, hey, if a tiger chases you, what will you do? He said, I'll run. He said, okay, the tiger runs as well. He said, I'll run faster. He said, tiger runs faster too. He said, I'll climb up a wall. He said, tiger climbed up the wall too. He said, I'll climb down. He said, the tiger climbed down. He said, go up a tree. And he said, tiger went up a tree, although they don't go up the tree. And the person stopped and said, stop. Are you on the tiger side or my side? So again, if we continue to say, in theory, the virus becomes so different that an immune system cannot handle it, then the answer is in this rhetorical point that the virus has become so different that we cannot handle it. So far, we haven't seen that difference. And the day we'll see that difference, that will not be a new variant. That will be a new pandemic. That will be cause SARS-CoV-3. And that is what would happen if that happens. So, so far, the, our immune system, vaccine generated or infection generated, should be able to handle it. <laughs> John Snyder, that is correct. You just have to run faster than the other one. <laughs> That's correct. Uh, Sunshine Bean says, hi, Dr. Bean. Question, which messenger RNA vaccine for anaphylactic reaction to antibiotic, which would be better, Moderna or Pfizer? Which mRNA vaccine for anaphylactic reaction to antibiotic? So I don't understand the reaction to antibiotic. If we take the messenger RNA vaccine, both of them, uh, Moderna and Pfizer, have polyethylene glycols in them or antifreeze in them so that they can they do not become frozen stone under the cold chain. And so because of that, there are those components that prevent them from freezing and becoming useless, becoming stones. And so um, those can cause reaction. There are other components in that in the vaccines too that can cause reaction. For example, we talked about a few days ago, we did a uh, talk about the administration of the second dose of Moderna vaccine to those who had the first allergi allergic reaction to the first dose. In that little case report of two people, we discussed that they tried polyethylene glycol as an allergic reaction component and there was no reaction. But when they tried Moderna, there was a reaction. So there may be something else in Moderna or Pfizer that causes reaction too. So now, which would be better, Moderna or Pfizer? Don't know. 
both of them are messenger rna they both have antifreeze in them they both could cause reaction and we do not know whose body reacts to them for example my son has had an anaphylactic reaction in the past has allergies used to we used to call ambulances sometimes when he'll come back playing outside and come back and have anaphylaxis from let's say poison ivy or poison oak and he went for moderna and nothing happened i mean thank god nothing happened but he was fine so who would develop the reaction is not known so ray tavers says i'm i'm still waiting for your answer dr b i asked you if you took the vaccine and if your answer is yes which one did you take please so yes i have taken the vaccine actually today 19th is my full in theory full protection day i took moderna i would have loved novavax but i didn't get it and they were not there yet so whichever vaccine was available after i became eligible last month's first because of my age i became eligible at that time so i then i actually <laughs> could not find a way to get myself on the schedule because every time i'll go to the app it would say uh, no uh, slot available finally one of my team members he asked his uh, wife uh, and i'm grateful to him his name is arjun so arjun asked his wife to set me up for, with the, with the vaccine and there are so many links and places where you you can go and do it so she got me a vaccine slot within 2 days so i got moderna and so when i went there they said moderna so i said fine uh, i like moderna as well so i got moderna the next dose i got on 5th of this month and then 14 days after is today 19 so today is in theory full protection day so i hope that answers that question <laughs> i i read john snyder's will run faster than you so sunshine bean thank you very much for the super sticker um then there is a super chat as well here uh lia jacobson says dr bean would you please let me know how being on rivaroxaban might affect the vaccines that can cause blood clots and would it be a problem with luffy metin and thank you so <laughs> kiss luffy i don't kiss luffy so my wife does but i don't uh, because luffy just grooms himself everywhere so i don't have the kissing thing with luffy uh, so the rivaroxaban or apixaban they are actually protective from adenovirus point of view so they are actually good thing now for the lufimectin it is possible that because lufimectin can cause some interference with the liver or liver metabolizes it predominantly instead of kidney for excretion and then if somebody is taking um, blood thinners for example the ivermectin in theory can have an effect of increasing the cap capability of blood thinners by accumulating them in the body so the dosage need to be either ivermectins or the blood thinners dose need to be adjusted that means one has to talk with the doctor to say hey i'm going to take this and look at the bleeding time and so on <laughs> france is old rule of the jungle um john rias says dr cory showed mexico's curve overlapped on top of israel's curve and showed that mexico is being as successful against covid as israel just by using ivermectin alone very low vaccine rate agreed i would agree with that so <clears throat> i this morning i talked about the family that i had managed about a year ago um, her father so she she was sending me notes to thank me and so she, uh, if i can very quickly just open it so the the here is a note and she said my father 56 year old hypertensive hypertensive with interstitial lung disease for seven day seven years uh, oxygen normally at 95 96 for last three years and she said that he contracted covid and she said what is interesting is that he had been taking prophylaxis and those things that i've been saying so vitamins and um things that i've been talking before so she said he was taking that and he actually in the family he was thought to be the one who would develop more severe outcome because of his comorbidities 
and he developed nothing and recovered in two days. And the only pointer they had was that he may have COVID, was that one, he had low grade fever, 98, 99. And secondly, or he said, I'm feverish. And secondly, his oxygen level had dropped from 95 down towards 93. So they suspected that there is something going on, but he was fine otherwise. And then they went and got the COVID test. He had meanwhile recovered and the COVID test came back positive. So that's a very good uh, outcome. Similarly, uh, Rima is here. She's talking about uh, some folks as well who were using ivermectin. I have uh, used ivermectin. There is just one case now, my class fellow's mother who developed COVID, we gave her high dose ivermectin and she did not uh, survive, she passed away. So that is my first case where I was um, helping to manage that. Although the management was in the beginning when she was at home, I was able to give her high dose. And then within two or three days, they took her to hospital and then ho hospital kind of stopped doing things that we were asking for and they engaged their own protocol. And then it became difficult and three, four days later, she passed away. But still, I was able to give her high doses for a few days and ideally that should have worked. So that is my only case so far. So it works actually. Christina, thank you very much. John Ria says, have you heard of sublingual ivermectin? Is it as effective as the normal pills? So basic rule is this. Sublingual or IV, I am subcutaneous versus oral. The basic difference is oral med will have to go and get absorbed from the GIT, go to liver, and then either become activated or filtered or have a first pass. Then go to the blood and go to tissues and do the function. And then you'd need to modify such a drug which needs liver's interference and um, activation. You have to activate that drug outside of the body to allow the very first pass to occur directly in the blood and go to the tissues and be functional. So if it is uh, sublingual, ideally, if it is activated, it would work. If it is IV, it should work. If it is IM, it should work. Uh, although I saw a study with IV that the efficacy was lesser than the oral, I do not know why, but that was one study. Maybe that's just an outlier. Tika says, Dr. Bean, I'm waiting for Novavax. Why did you say you will love this one? I'm being persecuted at work. I'm the only one with a mask, but I'm scared of this vaccine we have now. So Tika, the current vaccines are good as well. Uh, Moderna vaccine is awesome. Pfizer is awesome. Depending upon your age, I, I would say that Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca can be fine. Women under 50, there are so many choices that you don't have to, if you're in the US, you don't have to go for um, Johnson & Johnson. But Moderna and Pfizer are good. So um, I don't see a problem. So my request is that if because of me, you uh, decided that when I said I love Novavax, I, I love Novavax. I still love that concept. But if they're not there, then please protect yourself. So Sunshine Bean, any info about the matrix I'm adjuvant used in Novavax? The so same as we did before. I haven't done more research on that. Matrix M, some studies said that it causes reactions as well. And some studies said it is actually a very good adjuvant. Of course, <laughs> Novavax themselves say it is a very good adjuvant. Liza says, OK, so there is a how long after COVID you develop the urticaria? So there is a discussion going on. Margaret is here. Hey, Margaret, how are you? OK, so Margaret is talking with Carolyn. Um, Colin Hamill, hey, Hemi, how are you? Why not just infect everyone with rhinovirus? <laughs> are you referring to that study? We said that if a person is infected with one kind of cold, then their chances of protecting from other is better. Um, rhinovirus would give cold, but rhinovirus would not give cross protection to SARS-CoV-2. Delilah Davis says, hi, doctor, regarding your talk yesterday and today, estimated 30% of long haulers did not mount an antibody response to natural virus. What to do? What 
do you i think there is a continuity of the question so delilah i have to see that when they did not mount a response was it a weak response or was it a t cell response or was it a natural killer response was it an innate arm predominant i have to see that do you have some link that i can please tweet that at me i'll have to study the mechanism before i can say it is good or bad a cook says what are your thoughts on the pcr tests i have done research and they do not seem reliable for determining a sars virus so this uh, there are few myths that are out there in them pcr is one that PCR testing is not good, and the original inventor said it is not good, and then he died last year, and that, that is a conspiracy because he was revealing the truth. The thing that is important is to notice that PCR is going to say, I am seeing fragments of the RNA. It cannot determine if the actual virus is there and replicating and increasing. So because of that, PCR can say there are remnants of the virus that may be active virus or not. We take it as an active virus. And that is where the basic uh, disconnect is. I think that when a pandemic is going on, just having the clinical symptoms of cold should make us look at the SARS-CoV-2 before anything else. When I had cold a few months ago, I treated myself and all of the doctors, I cool bean doctors uh, who helped me treat myself, they were, they all said, regardless of, so my PCR actually came back negative, but before that, when we started management, we managed as if I had SARS CoV 2. PCR came back negative, we still managed as if, we, if I had SARS CoV 2. And so I kept taking whatever was necessary for SARS CoV 2. So the, um, in a pandemic, even just the clinical picture of the pandemic uh, virus or bacteria should make us think that this is that. So PCR, if it is only telling an RNA, that should be OK as well. The, the bigger fight that is happening is that, for example, people say that, hey, you know what, this uh, pandemic is nothing. The virus is a hoax or it is 99.9% .9 survivable. So why are we getting so crazy? So when you put the number, let's say 33 million, 35 million cases in US, the, that is more than 10%. So then that whole percentage thing that they are singing goes upside down. So then they start attacking the testing. We are doing more testing or the test itself is actually not reliable. So it seems like that is not a very useful discussion. What I've seen is somebody who's not going to believe in it will not believe in it. You do whatever. They'll simply say, you suck. You are wrong. I, you go check out my video for 12th March, I believe, in which I talked a little bit about Geared. And if you see the comments down below, people just keep saying, we don't trust you. We, we think Geert is a great doctor. You are not, and so on. So I think whoever has a particular mindset it is difficult to get them out of it. They are just looking for more gems to support their position. And I'm not sitting here providing gems to one side or the other. I'm just providing data. OK, so Terry says, would you feel comfortable giving Pfizer or Moderna to a teen with autism? Difficult question. The reason is, if behind this, the second question is that autism occurred because of some vaccine. And now we are talking about another vaccine. And then if I say yes, you would say, well, you you are so bad. So I will I have made my position very clear, very, very time, almost for the whole year. I'll say it again. Every time I do it, I get lots of uh, uh, critical feedback. But anyways, I am a pro-vaxxer. My whole family is vaccinated. My children are vaccinated. They were vaccinated when they were young. They are vaccinated when they are now. So Moderna or Pfizer are actually good vaccines. Uh, now, if the person is a female, then I would not want them to take adenoviruses just because I am hesitant about it because of the thrombocytopenia. If there was a protocol for protecting from them, then I'll be OK. 
I don't go with the idea of this is a rare occurrence and that is okay. It is a rare occurrence that is preventable. So why not tell me how you're going to pre prevent it? If it is a male, then um, even those are okay. But I like Pfizer and Moderna more. I love Novavax. We'll see what the results say from their trials. From a mechanism point of view, I love it. Then I love Moderna and Pfizer as well. <laughs> M. Gregory says, I'm usually pro-vaccine until recently. That's fine. And I'm going to share something very interesting. I have never said anything negative about anti-vaxxers compared to many other doctors online who just very profusely uh, badmouth them. But the most bad mouthing of me has occurred because of my anti-vaxxer friends. The vaccine, pro-vaccine folks who are here, they have never told me, other than maybe two people from UK, when I talked about AstraZeneca, who became very upset. Other than two pro-vaccine folks, actually one from here and one from UK, one from US, they became very, very upset. But from anti-vaccine group, even when I have never, ever criticized them, the most criticism and the most rude and unnecessary and uncalled for uh, comments are by anti-vaxxers. Rizobit says, please help. A doctor wants to prescribe monoclonal antibodies for my immune deficient son. Husband has COVID. No one has them. So you need the monoclonal. Look, if you are in the US, you, more than monoclonal, polyclonal Regeneron will be useful. And you can actually go to a hospital and ask for it. FDA has authorized it. There is an EUA for it. The only thing is you have to ask for it. So you can actually go to an emergency and you can ask for it. Sunshine Bean says, confused about what to do. Would someone with autoimmune disease, not immune suppressed, be at more risk of side effects from vaccine, assuming that immune system is already over responding? I would, I would adjust this message to say, if they are taking immune modulators to keep the immune system in check, then they're fine. And I have done this discussion before as well that, look, someone whose immune system is more active, and just like with allergic, we actually do not know whose immune system is going to respond negatively. But let's say this is a normal person's immune response or immune basal immune level. And this is a person who has overactive immune system. They take medicines to kind of shave off this top part and they keep themselves into this state. If that is a state and they take vaccines, no problem. They have kept their immune system in the normal state. Now, will the body have an allergic reaction? That we cannot guarantee for either. You cannot say that this normal person or this person who has more immune responses, we cannot say for either of them that the body would react. We don't know whose body would react negatively. Westfield says, too late for me to take sides. I've had my shots. I just want everyone to make their own decisions. And leave others alone. <laughs> That's fine. And I have practiced this for the whole year. Even then, the most criticism I get is from folks who do not want to have vaccine. Okay, so ambivalent full says, question, I've had my kid vaccinated with all the vaccines proven to be safe, but how can anyone say they are safe overall for all people considering they have only been used for a few months? And this is a um, agreeable statement that you're saying we are seeing that the vaccines are causing uh, anaphylaxis in some people. Vaccines are causing allergic reactions in some people. They are causing cardiac issues in uh, 62 Israeli youngsters. They are causing thrombosis in many people. So it's not that these are safe. Uh, so that is why I cannot sit here and tell people to go take a vaccine or go do not take a vaccine. I am, yes, I'm open about saying that the adenovirus-based vaccine for women under 50 years of age are not right until there is a protocol to manage when something wrong happens. It broke my heart when Marsha left me a message saying, my daughter has been in ICU and now she's going to be recovering for two months. And that was a mother when she said, 
she is not the same and i felt she could not bring herself to say that she has effects so she said she is not the same she would recover doctor says in 2 months this is what i don't like and people keep saying this is rare well here we are we are sitting here and we are seeing this i think this is my second case so we should just have proper planning for it um so you 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 find what you're saying is correct westfield thank you very much for the super chat abhishek says dr mean following you from last one year love your quest, uh, sessions question does a combination of ivermectin and egcg or quercetin with zinc can be taken instead of hydroxy yes it can be yes <laughs> susan pick is talking about chip insertion i was actually today trying to find a magnet to see if i can have the magnet attached to my deltoid muscle <clears throat> A cook says, "What are your thoughts about Reiner Fulmic lawsuit regarding PCR test? I have not looked at it. I can if you tweet the link to me. Um, Sartrip up says, just infected with COVID, started ivermectin 24 milligram, vitamins, budesonide, pavipiravir, COVID shield, first dose 45 days back." in general what should be looked at before adding fluvoxamine to treatment protocol uh, usually the neurological symptoms are a sign for fluvoxamine but if you have already added it or you have not added it usually the neurological symptoms if you have brain fog or if you have confusion or dizziness you can start fluvoxamine as well i am seeing that some doctors for example dr sayed hader they have just added it to their protocol regardless so there are doctors who have just added it to john snyder thank you very much uh, did anyone hear of people taking horse paste with ivermectin to heal many people have said that electric shaman says question thoughts on stephen lanka no idea <laughs> so if you think about my day um my day is mostly in the morning i do the talk and for that 9 o'clock talk i try to wake up during the night and just look at the latest for europe middle east asia africa if i don't then i become very nervous in the morning that what am i going to talk about so that's morning then from 10 till 1 or 2 in the day i have my business meetings and discussions from 3 so about 2 o'clock i take my lunch then 3 to now 6 i prepare for these talks that i do and for them i don't want to just say here is a news you are reading news from many other sources i don't want to just provide news i want to talk about the concepts that help us all be educated and informed and then based on that you make your life's decisions during this pandemic time so i do that and then after these talks that we will finish then uh, dinner and then just you know some time with family and then back to bed because of this i get very less time to look at a lot of other things until somebody pokes me and says how about you want to look at this so just poke me and say look at this dag gross says did you say that infection or mrna vaccine created more neutralizing antibodies different between sterilizing and neutralizing antibodies good questions so from this paper the paper said the antibodies produced by vaccine were comparable or exceeded the robustness of the antibodies produced by the infection i also clarified that to say this is actually not a fair comparison either side saying vaccine produces less than the infected person from the original infection or natural infection or natural infection person produces less compared to vaccine here is why everybody's immune system has a threshold where it would have taken care of the virus what is that threshold is different for everyone i'm going to make up some numbers let's say on a scale of 1 to 
maybe my immune system can handle the virus at the threshold two. Somebody else's immune system would take care of it at four. Somebody else's immune system might even go to 10 and still not take care of it and develop a cytokine storm and die. So comparing these levels is actually not a great way to compare. We also know convalescent plasma or convalescent, I do not know how to pronounce it. That plasma has not been very effective. So if you take the cells from a person who has recovered and then try to compare it to the vaccinated person who you gave vaccine, it may not be a, a fair comparison. So this comparison is not really a deterministic answer to say one is better or the other is better. Now to second part, difference between sterilizing and neutralizing antibodies. So in theory, a neutralizing antibody should be sterilizing. And let me explain what does that mean. So let's say this is a virus and we are making antibodies against it. And the antibodies are going to bind to, let's say, spike protein and not allow the virus to attach to our receptors at all. Then we have sterilized this virus. Virus cannot do anything. For this to happen, for example, in case of SARS-CoV-2, which is a respiratory virus, every pathogen that is, not every pathogen is respiratory. Because of that, not every pathogen would be a target of the discussion I'm going to do now. So for a respiratory virus, the mucous membranes need to have enough IgA in them that when the virus lands in our mouth or nose or eyes or wet surfaces, those IgAs capture the majority of the virus immediately there. So if the IgA is not in sufficient quantity, then it is not its sterilized. So one part of sterilization is gone. So think about neutralization that we can try to uh, catch the virus, but not fully. Neutralization, if we have a 100% neutralization, neutralization, if it is 100%, then that would mean sterilization. We have sterilized the virus. Sterilization. But, for example, in case of SARS-CoV-2, the neutralization is not 100%. In the, in the um, what is this? In the mucous membrane, we cannot 100% take the virus out. There is going to be some part of the virus, some viruses that are going to go deeper into the tissue and attach with the uh, ACE2 and get into the cells. So now this is the second part. Once they get into the cell, the cell, the nearby immune system should mount a response that no further attachment of the virus can occur with the cells. That is neutralization. If that is 100%, that is sterilization. But we know that that is also not happening with these. So sterilization means that you have just sterilized that pathogen. It cannot do anything. And neutralization when 100% is sterilization. These vaccines that we're talking about with SARS-CoV-2 are not 100% neutralizing. That means they're not sterilizing. Hopefully that, that answers that question. Um, <clears throat> Ren Pixie says, my brother is using elderberry. He does not want vaccine. He says the elderberry would stop virus from replicating. Any thoughts? Love to Luffy. So, um, I have no idea. I don't think that elderberry itself is sufficient to stop the virus. Roller girl. Hey, roller girl. Saw you after a long time. Hi, Dr. Bean, Cool Beans, and Luffy. Hello back to you as well. Welcome. Um, <clears throat> Doug, thank you very much. Um, Nina Lord says, Dr. Bean and Cool Beans, has anyone heard any stats on long haulers getting reinfected? No, I have not. Although next month I am participating in Dr. Tina Pierce's uh, discussion for the long haulers, her international conference, and I am presenting the uh, protocol. So I'll have to do some more research. So I'll look into it. And from Nina's name, I remember Nina Patel. Nina Patel, you had said that uh, I have blocked you. I have not blocked you, uh, neither in this one or afterwards. So uh, just. Uh, I have not. I like your comments. Crystal Murphy says, question, Dr. Bean. 
answer, Crystal. Um, Sunith Varghese says, Dr. Bean, could you explain what would happen if someone takes a different vaccine after, let's say, four to five months after taking two doses of another vaccine? Will that work like a booster dose? OK, so let's talk about this. Question is, what is the purpose of the booster? If the purpose of the booster, and I'm going to draw it, <laughs> I can't speak without drawing. So let's say here is a virus. And I'm just going to, for ease, I'm going to make its spike protein like a square. So let's say this is a virus. It binds here with the ACE2. And we have first dose and the second dose. And first dose is the priming, and the second dose is the boosting, but against this. Now, imagine if you say after six months, I want to take one more of this second dose that is going to prime my system, or sorry, boost my system further against this. And really, current vaccines have been designed. Their protocol has been designed to create enough boosting that we are fine after the initial two doses. So the third dose is not needed. But there is another concept of booster. The other concept of booster is that let's say this virus has now changed. And instead of the square uh, spike proteins, it has rounded spike proteins. And now we need to boost the immune system or reprime the immune system to fight against this variant as well then there may be another vaccine that may be needed. Although with the back boosting and with the uh, efficacy so far of the vaccine against the variants, I don't feel this is needed. I know that the vaccine company CEOs continue to tell the people, manage their expectation that you're going to have yearly vaccines. From the studies and data and these textbooks that I've read, it does not look like we would need that. So I hope that that answers that question. Colin Hamill says, vaccines should be and are up to yourself. People shouldn't be threatened into them by government or employees or your. Thank you very much. I actually, for those anti-vaccine friends who yell at me all the time, you cannot actually prove at any time that I pushed you to say you are a bad person if you didn't take the vaccine. So when I don't do it, <laughs> I don't think that you need to push back. Doug Gross says, how do vaccines cause all more spike proteins to be digested and presented versus viral spike proteins, which are mostly used to create viruses? Good question. So let's draw this as well. So the second part of your question is kind of not correct. So don't mind when I correct it. So first of all, let's take the second part. Viral spike protein, which are mostly used to create viruses. So number one, virus spike proteins are not created for the viruses or not used to create viruses. Here is what happens. Normal cell, and let's say got infected by SARS-CoV-2 because of the spike protein that bound with the ACE2 enzyme. The virus got internalized, phagocytosed, or fused with the membrane and entered the cell. Now it has the messenger RNA. That messenger RNA is going to be used to produce more viruses. Those viruses are cell unknowingly. Those viruses or the parts of the virus enzymes, the enzymes of the virus will take over our cells metabolic machinery they would take over our cells um, functional machinery and make more viruses so when they'll make more viruses and our cell would un innocently just assemble them for this virus then those viruses would get out right so here the spike protein's role in this whole thing was only to allow the virus to bind and to enter a cell so these new daughter cell uh, viruses that are formed, their spike protein's role is also to be able to help the virus bind to the next cells and enter them. And then this process continues. That is the role of spike protein. In addition to this, we have looked at the studies that say, hey, the spike protein alone, other than helping the virus to bind, this is also useful to create damage by the virus. That if there is spike protein that connects with the ACE2, this in itself, this binding, can start the second messenger systems inside the cell, which topple the cell's uh, behavior and cause the cell to become sick. And if it is an endothelial cell in the blood vessel, the cell would start getting inflamed. And then local inflammation and vascular damage can occur. So that's a different thing. That's a direct effect of spike protein causing damage. 
But when the spike protein is attached to a virus, it is only helping it to get into the cell. There is another outcome of this binding, this healthy binding, healthy I'm saying compared to this unhealthy binding, although all of it is unhealthy. So this binding, natural binding, there is another effect and that, that is when this binding occurs of the cell, the SARS-CoV-2 with the endothelium, then the endothelium still develops inflammatory problems. Now let's go to the vaccine. Do vaccines cause all more spike proteins to be digested and presented? Now, one more thing over here. When this, this virus is entering our cells, our cells are still trying to present this virus. They're still trying to shred it and present it on the MHC1. In the beginning, when the cell is more in control and the virus is less in control because there are less virus particles, it has not fully hijacked everything because it would, the virus will make more daughters and these daughters would take over more machinery. And they would just keep taking more and more of the, the cell's machinery to the point of killing the cell. But in the beginning, when cell is healthier and it found something incorrect in it, it is going to digest that virus, break it up and show it on the spike proteins. Then there are professional antigen presenting cells, which are macrophages, dendritic cells and B cells, whose function is to actually pick up these strange particles, viruses, and eat them up and digest them, chew them, and then present them. So this virus is getting presented as well. That is how immune system responds. Same thing would happen with the um, spike protein vaccine as well. Vaccine would bring this spike protein messenger RNA or DNA, whatever the type of vaccine is, that would produce the spike protein. Those spike proteins would then be broken down and presented on the surface, the pieces. So now if I go back to your question, how do vaccines cause all more spike proteins to be digested and presented versus viral spike proteins? So our immune system's response is the same. The question really is, in case of vaccines, what happens? We produce spike proteins inside the cell. Those are broken down, then presented on the sur cell surface. In case of a virus, we our cells do that as much as they can. They start the immune system. That is why we get the fever. That is why we start getting myalgias and the symptoms. That is not the virus. It is the immune system fighting the virus. And immune system would only fight the virus when we have digested the virus and presented it on MHC1 or MHC2. So hope, hope that answers that question, Doug. CJ91 says, can someone have a COVID vaccine overdose? Yes. So uh, remember a few days ago, some woman was given five doses in one shot. So for, I think fortunate for her that it didn't cause too much of an issue. But yeah, uh, an overdose of a vaccine can be given that could trigger the immune system so much badly that it could just violently react and cause uh, too much antibodies production, too much cytokine too much anaphylaxis. <laughs> Doug said, no. So Doug, Doug did that. Was that respond to me that I said, hopefully that answers your question. If not, please tell me what is the confusion. I'll answer that um, if I can. Aswar Sai says, how ivermectin reduces COVID? Aswar Sai, that's a very long question. Do me a favor in my videos. There are many videos which, um, where I have talked about mechanism of action of um, the ivermectin. Arvind Virmani says, Math Plus protocol has numerous drugs listed for treatment in hospital. Can you discuss when and at stages that are used for treatment? Arvind, the very original, very early time, my videos were actually to go over every single drug from Math Plus Protocol. So if you go back about a year ago, you would see every single drug that is part of Math Plus Protocol, I have discussed it. Dante Calderon says, hi, Dr. Bean, I'm from Peru. Would you mind? continuing giving us some further info or update info about ivermectin. I take it in drops. It's the only way I have to protect myself from COVID. Absolutely. So I continue to talk about ivermectin. I was actually preparing one more talk, which 
can be dangerous for my channel. So I'll put it on the other channel. And that is Ivermectin versus Tylenol. So I'll keep doing it. Kevin says, can you give update on master vaccine that can attack all coronaviruses? So they haven't gotten any further update yet. They said, here is a platform. We can make it. Let's move forward. But they are not they haven't moved forward. Today's paper also indicated that a vaccine that attacks NTD could also be a super vaccine as well. So no super vaccine yet. People have proposed mechanisms, but they are not taken up yet. I would suspect that that super vaccine would not be taken up because it is ma made cheaply from existing platforms. So why would some pharma company take it up? Because when they'll make it, it would be cheaply made and they would not earn. I think that is how the pharma generally is thinking. Alex says, uh, Dr. Bean, any thoughts on a study linking blood clots to EDTA components of AstraZeneca? Alex, that is interesting. Possible to tweet that to me, the link, so I can read it. Um, Dr. Bean underscore medical on Twitter. Kevin Prasner says, question, Dr. Bean, I love you, man. You are the best doctor in web. Thank you very much. Love you, too. Um, Annie Senket says, ESR 43, leukocyte 15K after day 26, only severe swelling in both legs, unable to stand properly due to pain, no weakness, no other symptoms, what it could be. Um, for After day 26, is it the vaccine or the infection? If it is vaccine and if it is an adenovirus-like vaccine, you should talk immediately to a doctor to see if it is thrombosis or not. <laughs> Love Bean says, what is that other channel? So I have made another channel. Let me show you. Where I thought I'll put those things <laughs> that may be more controversial. So if you go to YouTube and say... If you go over here and type, um, for example, ivermectin, ivermectin, what was the topic? How does ivermectin work? So if I say, how does ivermectin work? And then wait. Somewhere in here is my other channel. <laughs> Although YouTube does not like most of my channels. So here, wow, I'm on the third number. So if you go here, this is a channel called Mubin Sayed. In this channel, <clears throat> sorry, my computer is slow when I'm relaying as well. So on this channel, I have, so far I've just placed th three videos. One is how does ivermectin work, 14,000 views. Other one is ivermectin dose, 207,000 views. And then this one, potential management. So this was just me parking the long hauler discussion here. So not many views. So this is the other channel. So I'm going to, within a few days, add one more video here, which I think would bother some people. Okay, so <clears throat> Doug, did I respond? So Doug said, you describe vaccine spike proteins as being immediately digested and presented. Infected cells make many viruses, each has spikes. Why are spikes on different causes processed differently? Very good question. So, <clears throat> so I'm gonna share something very interesting. So let's look at it. One cell, and please tell me if I, I'm still answering the question or not. <laughs> Sometimes I like the concepts and I just discuss them. So you described vaccine spike proteins as being immediately digested. So that's not the case. So let's say vaccine arrives, it goes into the cell. It would be the lipid nanoparticle is removed. Then the messenger RNA is fed into ribosomes. This can take one ribosome can take eight hours to produce one protein. But it really depends upon the length of the protein 
the raw material available inside the cell and the efficiency, the energy available inside the cell. So all of those and the uh, ribosomes also need other enzymes to work with them like laborers to bring the raw material to them while they are manufacturing the protein. So it normally takes eight hours or more for one messenger RNA to translate that into a protein. So imagine eight hours are spent and then there is a protein string, long rope is produced, which then needs to be folded. So then we have enzymes who are folders, who are chaperons to fold. They would help a protein kind of become a three dimensional ball like thing. So that takes some effort as well on the cells part to help that. Then the cell says, oh my God, this is actually a foreign protein. We, I don't recognize this one. So what it does is it would push that into a um, digestive vacuole where it would pour some acids on it and break it down. So this would take another day or so. And when that is broken down, those pieces that are broken in, and this is an endosomal function, then those pieces are not just released even within the cell. They are immediately pushed into Golgi apparatus. And the Golgi apparatuses have small... Um, pieces in their MHC2 or MHC1, which would then, or other vesicles have these as well. So then they are, these tiny pieces of broken antigen are loaded on the MHC1 and 2, and then they are sent to surface. And that also takes hours and days. So the whole process of getting a vaccine, breaking it down, bringing it out takes time. So you can, you can ask this question, that why would the immediate reaction occurs? Innate arm becomes active right away. When it sees something curious, it's going to just start picking it up and start reacting to it without making a vaccine. So it's going to pick up a lipid nanoparticle, for example, and just react to that. Instead of saying, okay, you know, there is a messenger RNA in it. I'm going to convert that into a spike protein or a protein and see what happens. And then I'm going to react to it. Innate arm is just going to react to that lipid nanoparticle and the, and the RNA in it. So the reaction starts immediately, but that reaction is towards the lipids or towards the RNA. We want the reaction towards pieces of the antigen, and that can take some time. So that is one. Infected cells make many viruses. Each has spikes. Why are spikes in the different causes processes differently? So... If I get your question correctly, what you're saying is compare that to an infected cell, which has many viruses, many SARS-CoV-2s that entered it, and it is making many um, proteins as well, many spike proteins and the N proteins and the M proteins and lipids and the RNAs. This is a live virus being built, so it would produce many proteins. In the beginning, this infected cell is actually healthier. So it would actually push these all things into the Golgi apparatus as well and try to digest them as well. And then it doesn't push them in the Golgi apparatus. I know medicos are going to now criticize that. Why did you say Golgi? It pushes them into the vacuoles where it digests them, then brings the pieces and puts them where they should be loaded for MSC1 or 2, depending upon the cell type, and then presented on the surface. And this can take much time as well. Now the antigen pieces that are presented on the surface because it's not the spike protein from vaccine or the spike protein from the virus itself presented. Instead, let's say if this is a spike protein, spike protein is going to be common between the virus and the vaccine. But let's say this is a spike protein. It is, it is a glass. We break it down and we make small pieces of it. Usually, so let's say spike protein is about 7,000 bricks long, 7,000 amino acids long. When we break it down, we break it down to pieces that are 10 amino acids, 20 amino acids, 30 amino acids. That happens for both infected or vaccinated ones. Those smaller pieces are the ones that are then shown on the surface. So the surface never shows an actual spike protein. And there is no difference for what is shown from infected or vaccine because we're showing pieces. This is possible that if you break two glasses, one of them would have a different pattern of the broken pieces, and the other one would have a different pattern of the broken pieces. So this is possible that one cell shows a piece like this, and the other cell shows a piece like this. That's okay. 
So I hope, so there is a question behind this question. So if you tell me that question as well, I'll try to answer that. Roman is here. Roman, how are you? A Simple Garden, Dr. Bean and Cool Bean started this group where all were welcome. Many of this group still hold this view, but there are a few who don't. Don't let them get to you. Yes. And um, <laughs> they get to me sometimes. But I have still, I believe this. Well, I tell myself that, hey, I can go back to being myself and being in my corner. Once the pandemic is over, I'll just be Mubin with all of my beliefs. But at this time, we we need to, the ones who are presenting especially, we have to stay neutral to present the information. Now, you could tell me that my bias is, for example, I don't present 5G. And many people have said, if you're that neutral, why don't you talk about 5G? I just don't feel comfortable talking about 5G. So you can say that is my bias. So when I'm saying I'm not biased, I still have a bias. I'm not going to talk about 5G. Or somebody comes in and says, well, if you're that non-biased, why don't you go talk with Geert? And I'm not going to talk with Geert because it says 2 plus 2 is 6. So that means I have my biases too. But I still try to bring in things that are, for example, pro-vaccine. And then three things that are that cause us to be a little concerned about vaccines, the side effects, the thrombosis, and so on. I was the first one here to start talking about thrombosis on videos. And I got so much heat for that. But now, even those who are pro-vaccine would look back and say, Mubin was doing right at that time. Now everybody acknowledges it. Now they say in UK and in other European countries, they're saying women under 50 should not take it. And if you've taken the first dose of AstraZeneca, take something else as a second dose. That's the I was trying to say, find a solution. Anyways, Roman, thank you. <laughs> Skyfrog says you need a faster computer. Yes, I need a faster computer. This is my computer from 2015. It's a Mac. I love it. But it has gotten a little old. That's correct. Nuna H says, Dr. Bean, you have helped so many. I'm very happy hearing both sides of it. So thank you very much. Um, let's see. <clears throat> No, by heart, 75 year old started headaches after Moderna, weeks after second dose, still takes aspirin and curcumin. History of anaphylaxis reaction, didn't have one after Moderna. What may help? Ivermectin or fluvoxamine. So, the good news is that the uh, it doesn't look like anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis usually is immediate and severe. So, not knowing exactly what is causing it. I don't think fluvoxamine is a good uh, drug to go to. Ivermectin is good. Again, I cannot advise you. I'm just saying in general, from an educational point of view, uh, if I have, for example, my wife had uh, pains and aches, so I gave her general anti-inflammatories and then Ivermectin. It is interesting that I told her like <laughs> 10 times to take Ivermectin. And she said, no, <laughs> she went for normal painkillers. She didn't take ivermectin. So even in my own home, <laughs> there are folks who would say, no, I'm not taking it. And so when she started developing heartburn from the anti-inflammatories, then I said, please now take ivermectin. It won't cause that. So Denise says, sounds like mass cell activation syndrome, flare post-vaccine. And if that is the case, then antihistamines would help. <clears throat> Thank you, Denise. Kevin says, Dr. Bean, if you were to give your best possible truth, would you say COVID originated in a lab? <laughs> Let's be real. What to do? What do you think? It's too sophisticated to be animal born. So you're putting me in trouble, huh, Kevin? So I have thought about this many times. My uncle who raised me, I think cool beans who are with me for a long time, they know I come from a broken family. My parents had separated. So my, my uncle raised me. My uncle had in a very young age told me that if you have not seen something with your eyes or heard something with your own ears, then you cannot talk about it with, uh, with confidence that this is the truth. 
So he had always advised me that for me, the truth will be something that I saw or something that I heard. So I've not seen or heard any of this. Was it in lab or was it not in lab? I do believe this much that this is the first virus with so much of um, functional uh, spectrum, such a wide spectrum of its functions, that I cannot imagine if this kind of a virus was out there and it would not have caused destruction before. The, the way it reacts, the way it triggers cytokines, the, the way it causes vascular disease, the way an upper respiratory virus, coronaviruses are upper respiratory viruses because they like cool temperature and it goes down. And for all of these things that I'm saying, there are biological reasons as well. For example, bats are warm blood and this is a virus coming from the bat. So they are warm temper temperature animals. So that is why it lives in the warm temperatures too. Then those spike proteins with such sophistication, which is very different from others. So there are so many functions that this virus has, that it looks like a, a work of art from the way it behaves. But I have not seen it to be built in a lab. I've not seen it to be coming from a bat. So I just don't know. And I do not have enough resources to be able to go and do this investigation. So because of that, Kevin, it's a very good question. I think about it a lot, that how come a virus has so much of uh, uh, variety and, and sophistication in its behavior, but I still do not know. Gino DC says, if you see a bear, walk, bear walking down the street and there is a zoo nearby, I think there's a good chance it escaped from the zoo rather than ran in from the mountains. OK, Gino, thank you very much. Faith and grace. In the article you mentioned, the vaccine also protects against other coronaviruses. Wouldn't that mean that other coronaviruses can cause a false SARS-CoV-2 positive test? If the other, so hey, very good question. Usually what they do is when they're making, for example, PCR tests or when they're making antibody tests, usually what they do is let's say we line up genetic material from some coronaviruses. This is coronavirus A, this is B, this is C. And let's say there are a bunch of genetic pieces that are similar. And then there are some pieces that are dissimilar. Their job, researcher's job, is to find these dissimilar pieces and then target them for testing. This is called a signal, right? Their signal for testing, normally there are three signals on the test kits. That means they try to uh, recognize three unique areas of the virus genetic. So that means in this SARS-CoV-2, compared to other coronaviruses, the researchers had to find at least three areas that were different on this one and then create test to target or find them. And we saw that in UK, one of the test kits failed because the virus created a mutation and one of the signal failed. And that was how they actually started detecting the 117 because 117 was failing on one and not failing on others. But that is how they tried to create it uniquely. And they can do that. <laughs> I'm seeing some cool beans cutting some wise jokes. Um, so, Ogi, Ogui Music says, Dr. Bean, how does the body, after incorporating the messenger RNA vaccine, differentiates it from self? if it is not naturally recognized through antigen presenting cells. It's a, actually the, so this, the question is incorrect because this is what does not happen, but let me address it. And this is something that happens. Uh, this myth 
is out there a lot as well. Myth is this, that the messenger RNA that comes in somehow becomes incorporated into our DNA. And now it becomes part of the DNA. The problem is there is no way for this messenger RNA to become part of DNA without here are the technologies. And by the way, the technologies I'm going to now talk about, we have not been successful enough with them. These are conceptual technologies. We haven't been able to be successful enough with them to actually use these technologies to do gene therapies. Otherwise, if that was the case, we have so many of the genetic diseases that are deb debilitating. Genetic diseases that kill children in very young ages. That if we could do this, what I'm going to mention, we would have cured them first. And, and pharma companies can earn a lot from that. Similarly, if we could do it, we would have cured cancers with those technologies as well. And pharma would have earned a lot from this. Parents would give anything to save their children. And people would do everything they can to protect themselves from cancers. So here is what is possible, theoretically possible. A component has to have, number one, an enzyme that would cause reverse transcription. And some viruses have re reverse transcriptase in them. So retro viruses names are retro. They cause retro. They go retro. They cause reversal. So reverse transcription. That means we take the messenger RNA or RNA. We convert it into a complementary DNA. For that, there's a complex set of processes to do the reverse transcription and create the complementary DNA. Then from the complementary DNA, we have to create the actual DNA, non-complementary DNA or the actual DNA path or structure. Then we have to haul this DNA. So let's say this is what happened in the cytoplasm of the cell. Cytoplasm is this part, and then we will talk about the nucleus. So this is what is happening in the cytoplasm. Either we have the complementary DNA and we need to take that to the nucleus, or we made a string of DNA and we need to take that to the nucleus. Now we go to the nucleus. And please remember that this, this all has to be done in a protected fashion, that nothing in the cell, no cops inside the cell figure this out. Cell is very, very smart. When, he's, when it sees any antigens running around, it captures them and it destroys them. And if it cannot destroy them, it destroys itself. It commits suicide. So, but anyways, let's say theoretically, this complementary DNA is now brought into the nucleus, hauled in there through nuclear pores. Nuclear pores. Fine. Now the, there's a piece of DNA that is here. Next piece is to, so we have our own DNA is sitting in there. Do you know it is wound around um, protein? So, Imagine you have a very long rope and you want to store that into a small place. What you'll do is you'll kind of wind it on top of some balls and then make it a tiny little mush and then put that in a box. That is how our DNA is. It is wrapped around tiny little balls and it is kind of mushed together and put that in the nucleus. This thing that is now in the nucleus it has to now beg some enzymes. It has to ask them to incorporate it into the DNA. Now, to incorporate that, what we need is, first of all, we need an enzyme to cut the DNA. It's a very sensitive process. Normally, it does not occur in our cells unless the cell's type is such where, for example, B cells, when they do class switching, they cut their DNA. They're very specialized, and they do that for from going to immunoglobulin M to, to G or others. They cut the DNA. But they don't insert new DNA. They remove pieces. But we need something to cut the DNA. And so let's say here is a piece of DNA. And we got an enzyme that came in and that cut it from here. So now the DNA is, and th this is the CRISPR technology, which 
is being built. So now the DNA is cut. Then what we need to do is we need to take this string of DNA. We cannot just insert both of those pieces here. We have to insert one piece here and let the other complementary piece be built here. So now what we have to do is we have to go to another set of enzymes to say, pretty please, can you please help me take this one piece of DNA and attach it here? So think about it for a second. Who is coordinating all of this? When a cell is replicating and making a copy of the DNA, that is a dumb thing to do because it just makes a copy, although that's a very complex function as well. Here we are saying, I'm going to cut the DNA. I'm going to request you to take this piece and attach it here. Imagine we humans are doing this thing. Imagine how many people are needed to coordinate this whole thing. So now we need an enzyme that has cut this. Then we need another enzyme to go take this DNA, take the complementary part of it, bring that in here. Then we need another set of enzymes to say, please attach it here, weld it here. And another enzyme to say, attach it here, weld it here. CRISPR technologies do that. So now it is attached there. Question, even before this whole thing occurred, where in the DNA we want to attach it? Why? Because let's say we have a gene here. Let's say this gene makes thyroid hormone. And if we unfortunately cut this gene in the middle and try to insert another gene in here, this function would become destroyed. This is like you take a recipe book and you break it in the middle and try to attach another book in, this, in the center. Now the recipe is not continuous anymore. So we have to figure out exactly where to insert this new gene. And to insert that new gene, we have to figure, create CRISPR technologies and create patterns that needs to go and do this process. We haven't yet found very good ways to exactly cut where we want and add something that we want. We, in concept, we can do it. In labs, we can do it. We cannot do it wholesale in our bodies yet. So we cut this. We ask more enzymes to come do this. Who's going to convince those enzymes to come do it? They're not just going to say, all right, I'm going to go and do this for you. So the, the vaccine itself has to bring that with that. OK, so let's say that is also possible and complementary DNA is done. Then we need polymerases, which is another set of enzymes, who would come in and say, you know what? I'm going to make a complementary strand here that would bind with this one. So you say, voila, we got a new gene in here. The problem is now would come the proofreaders. If a tiny virus like SARS-CoV-2 has its own proofreaders that do not let its genetic material become unstable, we have very sophisticated proofreaders. So our proofreaders are going to come in and they're going to start inspecting that what the hell is this? And they're going to see, is this something that belongs to us? Is this a gene that should be here? Is this a correctly put gene here? And if not, they are going to excise this piece and cut it and remove it and then rejoin the two pieces. It happens all the time. When we get mutation from x-rays or mutation from sunlight or mutation because of some chemical substances, either our cells can remove the damaged pieces and replace them with the correct pieces or the cell dies. This is why we develop cancers or this is why we develop burnt skin because the cells over there decided that, hey, I cannot handle it anymore. I'm going to die. So here the proofreaders come in. If they do not like what happened here, they are going to remove it and reconnect the DNA. If they were not able to do anything about it, they're going to tell the, the DNA to be marked. There are proteins that are called ubiquitins. And you can look them up, all of them. I'm not making these things up. You can just Google them. Ubiquitin. Actually, let me just Google it for you so you don't think I'm ubiquitin. Ubiquitin is a small protein that exists in all eukaryotic cells. It performs its myriad functions through con conjugation to a large range of target proteins. A variety of different modifications can occur. So that is ubiquitin. And then look up caspases. Caspases. I'm spelling it correctly. Caspases. Caspases are a family of protease enzymes that are playing an essential role in the programmed cell death. 
So now what happens is if this proofreading doesn't go well, or if some enzyme doesn't work well over here, and if there is some incorrect thing that is found, which will be found, ubiquitins will be attached here. So either we can excise it and correct the DNA, and if we cannot correct the DNA, we'll plant a flag there that will be a ubiquitin. We'll mark this cell to death. And the ubiquitin, once it is activated, it would cause caspases to become activated. Caspases would actually tell the cell to kill itself. The cell would kill itself. That is what happens when gene therapy from sunlight occurs, when gene therapy from x-rays occur, when gene therapy from chemical substances occur, when gene therapy from viruses occur. There are some viruses that try to meddle with our DNA and our cells die. They don't let them meddle that way. If it was that simple, we would have been very different animals all the time. People would have non-human looking people. So now going back to your question. Um, how does the body after incorporating the mRNA? So this first part of the question is wrong. We don't incorporate mRNA. We receive mRNA in the cytoplasm. We attach it to the ribosome. We make proteins from it. Then we destroy the mRNA. We don't incorporate an mRNA anywhere. Um, then how do we differentiate from it? Actually, we don't need to differentiate from it because we destroy all mRNA, our mRNA or foreign mRNA. That is our function. Uh, Again, if you wanted to say, hey, Mubin is just making up things, you go in here, Google, whatever, and say, Dr. Go, if you like, you say RNases, ribonucleases. RNases is a type of nucleus that catalyzes the degradation of RNA into smaller components. So we destroy our own RNA as well. We don't keep those things around. It's not like these books that we just put them. Our cell has a behavior of building something, then destroying everything that was used up in building. And if it needs to build it again, it would build the things to build the, the, the component. So then, so the second part, vaccine differentiates it from self if it is not naturally recognized through antigen presenting cells. So I hope that this clears that this whole question itself is not uh, possible. So <clears throat> with this, let us stop for today. I was thinking, so this Friday we have Dr. Tina Pierce in the morning at 9 o'clock because she's from UK. Uh, we'll talk about the long haulers with her. And I was thinking there are so many questions and then the questions are left. And uh, today we've been talking for more than two hours. Maybe this week, next week, if you like, we can do a session continuing from 9 o'clock in the morning after my morning discussion and just continue that till I can answer as many questions as I can. So if you would like it, please leave a comment here. We'll do a 10 hour session, doesn't matter. I'll just have to take my breaks for water and stuff, but we'll continue to talk. If that is something that would help, I can do this. Um, so thank you very much. Please like, subscribe and share, minimum <laughs> like it. And then uh, if you wanna support this work, please do me a favor. There is a link that you can use PayPal to support this work. There is another link to buy me a coffee. You don't need to use PayPal. And then there is another link to become a patron. You can continue to support this work for healthcare professionals and students. So thank you very much. And I would see you tomorrow morning. Bye-bye.